Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be sharing some psychological reflections on the teachings of the early 20th century mystic George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. With me is Professor Charles Tart, an emeritus professor of psychology at the University of California, Davis, and also the Institute for Transpersonal Psychology. Dr. Tart is an old friend and a mentor of mine and is the author of many important books in the field of psychology, including Waking Up, a book largely based on the teachings of Gurdjieff. Some of his other titles include States of Consciousness, Open Mind, Discriminating Mind, and the classic anthology Altered States of Consciousness. Welcome, Charlie. Hi, Jeff. Pleasure to be with you. Let's talk a little bit to, uh, to begin with about who Gurdjieff was. I imagine many of our viewers will have never heard of him. He was born in what today we would call Armenia, unless the politics have changed it since the last time I looked on a map. Grew up um, as a nominal Christian, but in a very multicultural area. It was one of these areas that different empires have conquered every 50 or 100 years and kept constant mixing of the population. So he was exposed to many different religious traditions. And he gradually developed the conviction that all these religious tradition, traditions had inherited some genuine knowledge that was possessed in a much purer form some time ago, and then it, they had messed it all up in their various mm -hmm. religious activities. And he got very, very interested. In, could he find the source? was the source of this real spiritual knowledge still available anywhere mm -hmm. and spent much of his life searching for it and after he thought he had found a major source, maybe the major source, teaching it until he died in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. So he, he was a seeker for much of yes, his life. very much a seeker. And then he became a teacher. And mm -hmm. uh, probably some viewers are aware of the Peter Brooks movie uh, based on his book, yes. Meetings with Remarkable Men. Fantastic movie. Yeah. Yeah, very worthwhile movie. Particularly the scene toward the end where the monks are performing these sacred dances mm -hmm. that were things Gurdjieff taught his students and the belief about them is that they communicate a special kind of knowledge to a certain aspect of our minds, not our intellectual minds or our emotional minds. I've had a little experience with those. I think they do somehow, mm -hmm. but I would have no way of expressing mm -hmm. what it is, but something, some kind of information is transmitted. So the, this Gurdjieff's story is that in his seeking, he eventually made contact with a secret order of uh, monks in a, in a hidden monastery and mm -hmm. there he studied and he learned their methods and then he brought them out into the world. Isn't that romantic? It is, right? actually. Yeah. It, was, it was an organization supposedly called the Sarmuni Brotherhood, mm -hmm. but I've never been able to write to the registrar to ask if Gurdjieff really got a master's degree from them. <laughs> uh, he, yeah. may, he may have made it up or not. It's hard. Gurdjieff was very insistent that he was teaching ways of development and principles that people had to learn for themselves. And the last thing they should do should get be hung up on his personality. Mm -hmm. So he deliberately obscured a lot of details of his life. And that might have included making some of them up, just so mm -hmm. people kept trying to trace them down. They'd be frustrated and get back to the real work. Well, some of his writings also, I know, are, are very dense. The book, Meetings with Remarkable Men, is quite approachable, but oh, yeah. his, his other great uh, magnum opus, uh, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson, is uh, almost impossible. Yep. And I'm told it's impossible by design. Mm -hmm. That Gurdjieff thought he had such important teachings there 
that people had to grasp them, but we had no appreciation of anything we grasped easily. Mm -hmm. So the story is that he would write a chapter in this Beelzebub's Tales and read it to a group of his students, and if they got it, he'd go back and rewrite it to make it denser and harder to follow. <laughs> Whoa, that's, that's hard for when you value clear writing. Yeah. I, I don't pretend to understand Bales above tales. Also, either. from a business perspective, if you no publisher wants to write a book that's impossible, or publish a book that's impossible to read. <laughs> and yet, Gurdjieff, as I recall, was a successful businessman. Mm-hmm. And a very varied businessman from selling rugs to mm -hmm. who knows what sort of deals he got into, and apparently shady sometimes too in his business dealings, mm -hmm. as he didn't have much respect for ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And he th if he thought you were basically somebody motivated by greed, it didn't matter if he took advantage of you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not an attitude I like, but. Yeah. Well, what we have to, re to, re to the Gurdjieff work? Well, I had been trying to find some kind of spiritual development system that would actually produce spiritual growth and spiritual experiences mm -hmm. without much success. And I would tried to learn various kinds of meditation, mainly from books, from in contact with a few teachers. And I was a lousy meditator. It was, it was a few years later that I basically gave up meditation to deciding it required a special talent I didn't have. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in retrospect, it's like all the meditation instructions say, first quiet your mind and then, and I couldn't get to the end then part. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I remember Tibetan Lama, I took many classes on meditation from, and he was always talking about the space between thoughts. And I thought, what a fascinating concept, the space between thoughts. Mm -hmm. There's no space between minds. Zip, 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 zip. <laughs> uh, there can be a space between yeah. thoughts, but I wasn't getting anywhere with the stuff called meditation. And then I came across Ospensky's book, In Search of the Miraculous, mm -hmm. which for a long time I've recommended as the best book on Gurdjieff's teachings. Mm -hmm. Probably even better than the ones I've written, but different in their emphasis somehow. Yeah. And Ospensky was a journalist mm. in Russia, so he made his living by writing clearly, mm -hmm. in some sense. And he discovered Gurdjieff and wrote about many of his ideas, was his chief disciple for a long time, although eventually they had some kind of falling out and split up. Mm -hmm. But Gurdjieff came back to the West via the Middle East, what was it, 1930s or something like he that? He had an institute in Paris. He visited yeah. New York, I, I know. And, and he was starting to do work in Russia, but then when the Russian Revolution came along, he moved, but there's still Gurdjieff groups mm -hmm. in Russia, apparently. Mm -hmm. And he spent most of the rest of his life teaching in the West. And today there are existing, without much publicity, Gurdjieff groups here and there. Uh, many of them have the attitude that if you can't find them on your own, you're not ready for their teaching anyway. I know occasionally may be a great test I'm in a public library and I pick up a, a Gurdjieff book and there's a little bookmark inside of it mm -hmm. that uh, says if you want more information, call this phone number. Yeah, because you've passed a preliminary test, you're interested enough to have been looking at a book on Gurdjieff. Yeah. Now, I think his teachings are profound, okay? Mm -hmm. And my first understanding of that was a purely intellectual perspective. I read Ospensky's book, and about half of it I couldn't understand at all, okay? Mm -hmm. Gurdjieff talks about the nature of the cosmos and all that, and it's stuff that's so far beyond anybody's ordinary experience that mm -hmm. I have no idea whether it's profound truth or total nonsense. So I don't pay much attention mm -hmm. to that part. And he has but a unique language. You kind yeah. of have to learn the right. Uh, that was part of his making you work in order to, to learn something. Yeah. But the other half is about the way the mind functions. And it struck me he was right on mm -hmm. about so many things. And what particularly influenced me was that one day while I was uh, at the University of Virginia teaching and doing some research, I was reading Ospensky's book, and he was describing Gurdjieff's method of becoming more awake or aware, of mm -hmm. waking up was the attitude he used. Yeah. And the essence of the method 
is that ordinarily our attention gets totally absorbed in whatever we're perceiving. You know, so if I was listening to you or talking to you, I'd be all absorbed in what you're saying and so forth. But Gurdjieff said you have to split your attention so you're also paying attention backwards to how you're reacting and what you're doing as well as what you're taking in from the outside. So I was trying to do that while reading it and for a few seconds it worked. And this was 50 years ago and I couldn't really describe at the time what happened so it, it's even harder now but I have to say that at least in a relative sense I woke up. Mm -hmm. I for a few seconds, I was in a state of consciousness where somehow it was perfectly clear that my ordinary consciousness was just a dull bunch of conditioned responses. Uh -huh. Even though by ordinary standards, I was a smart intellectual and practical person and all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but I wasn't awake. And then I went back to my usual sleep and could think about it intellectually and talk mm -hmm. about it and whatnot, but it was years before I could actually have that even moment of waking experience again. So it lasted just a few seconds yeah. and it had a profound impact but it, on you. It was so obviously different. Mm -hmm. And I thought of myself as having a pretty stubborn mind. You know, mm -hmm. it didn't change easily. Yeah. But Gurdjieff's primary teaching that he approached people with is man is asleep. Now, of course, we'd want to make it politically correct today and say humans are asleep and all that. Yeah. And what he really meant by that, to put it in better language, is not that we're asleep in the sense that we're not at all responsive, but that we're living in an internal daydream. Mm -hmm. And that daydream is distorting our perceptions of everything, our reactions, and the way we then act back. So we're sleepwalking through life. Yeah. And we have enormous amounts of quite specific evidence of that in ordinary psychology now. Mm -hmm. For instance, from the, the clinical psychology courses I took, I learned a lot about defense mechanisms, right. whereby parts of our mind automatically react to distort our perceptions, to protect us from certain feelings and so forth. And Gurdjieff was talking about it in a general way, but it was true. We, in a very real sense, a lot of times we were at home. Mm -hmm. So what Gurdjieff was saying that if you live your life that way, it's been a wasted life. And, you know, he had weird cosmological theories about what it did for the evolution of the universe mm -hmm. to turn you into food, basically. Weirdest it, stuff it, I ever Food for read. the moon, as I yeah, recall. And, you know, it <laughs> made no sense to me. Maybe it was to scare people to say, look, if you don't start mm -hmm. training your attention to wake up, yeah. your life is not going to be worthwhile, you know. An extreme form of the old saying, the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, it's also intriguing to me that his discussion of man is asleep occurred roughly at the same time that Sigmund Freud was developing the notion of subconscious mm -hmm. defense mechanisms right. and psychoanalysis as a, a cure. Mm -hmm. Freud was getting specific about some of the specific ways in which we're asleep. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say, you know, modern psychology in a sense, if it will put its knowledge in this Gurdjieffian perspective, has come up with a lot of the specifics of the ways in which mm -hmm. we're asleep. Although the, the cure is very different. Yes, the cure is to become normal. But Gurdjieff would say, your normal culture is asleep too. So, you know, you're uncomfortable if you're asleep in a different way than the culture, so you want to be normal, but you haven't really advanced very much just to fit in with your, your culture's dreams and distortions and neuroses. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the cures you mentioned are these physical dance-like movements. Partly that was, I think, primarily training attention. Mm -hmm. Partly, primarily, that's... A, Never mind. <laughs> I was just thinking about this recently as I saw a video of some of the Gurdjieff movements, and I remembered that one that's in the uh, Meetings with Remarkable Men movie and so forth, and I was comparing it with the whirling dervishes. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, the whirling dervishes, what they do takes some discipline, but their aim is to get into an altered state of consciousness that has mystical significance. Right. The Gurdjieff movements are more, much more complex. You have to be precisely aware to know exactly when you open your hand, when you lift your arm, 
when you turn your head and so forth. So they're training in being precisely present instant by instant to the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think they convey something else too. But they're clearly major training in becoming more precisely here. And not about, for example, going into a trance no. state. No. Uh, Gurdjieff would be anti-trance mm -hmm. in a sense. Gurdjieff talked about altered states, but he said, first, the problem is you have to get out of the sleep that you're in. Mm -hmm. This was combined with another one of his ideas that we have three major kinds of intelligences. He called them centers, but I think intelligences would be a good word for it. One was intellectual. Mm -hmm. Okay? No sweat on that. I, I had a black belt in talking by the time I was 12. You know, I, I, I'm good with words. Yeah. The other was emotional mm -hmm. intelligence, and the third was this body instinctive kind of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And Gurdjieff said the problem of almost everyone is that only one of those kinds of intelligence is developed. So for instance, so many times I was in an emotional situation and I tried to solve it intellectually, mm. and it didn't resonate with the realities of the situation. Or some people, you know, they're centered in this body intelligence, there's a problem, you push your way through, instead of paying attention to the intellectual or emotional aspects. That we're beginning in psychology to recognize the value of emotional intelligence and bodily instinctive intelligence is wonderful. Because Gurdjieff said, these three have to be reasonably balanced. Mm -hmm. Not that they have to be perfect, but it's like each of them has to be able to function well on its own in taking in the world and reasoning about it in mm -hmm. its own style. Mm -hmm. and. One of them cannot be so much more overdeveloped that it knocks out the functioning of the others. Uh -huh. If you reach that level of balanced development, mm -hmm. then the possibility of a much deeper spiritual self becomes real, not just an interesting fantasy. Mm -hmm. And there are higher levels of development. That's all getting very theoretical for yeah. me, okay? But it does fit into what I think of as a positive framework in that Gurdjieff's worldview is that the universe, including the intelligence of it, is evolving. Mm -hmm. And if you wake up more, you can participate in the evolution of the universe rather than, say, a Buddhist kind of thing where this is samsara, it's all illusion and inherent suffering, and getting out of here is the, the important thing rather than evolving. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a child of the 20th century, yeah. progress and whatnot. I go for evolution. Well, as a psychologist, uh, especially these days, one might say there are forms of psychotherapy that deal with uh, awakening the body's intelligence. There's a whole uh, school uh, or s many schools of, of body therapy. Mm -hmm. Most of them go back to the work of Wilhelm Reich mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, removing the body's armor. Yes, for example. And then there are schools of psychotherapy that are uh, deal in particular with the emotions. And mm -hmm. there are schools of psychotherapy that are based on uh, cognitive processes. Right. Realize uh, rationally mm -hmm. that you're being stupid and stop it. <laughs> 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 but Gurdjieff um, is doing two things differently, it seems to me. One, he's not a psychotherapist. He's not... Uh, promising uh, psychotherapy. He's, he's doing it in a completely different context, and he's trying to work on all of these areas simultaneously. Yeah. And he's not gentle about it either. Mm -hmm. I mean, his attitude was that if you don't get more awake, your life has been a waste. Mm. And so if you're not willing to work hard on it, too bad. Uh, he Many people came to him because he was known as a mystic, full of romantic ideas of cosmic love and brotherhood and all that. And to him, these people were so out of touch with reality, they didn't have a chance. He'd chase them away. Mm -hmm. um, and he'd do other things to really train people, like he had one Russian refugee living at his center in France who apparently was the world's most annoying man. <laughs> he drove everybody nuts. Uh -huh. And the students all hated him. Yeah. And the students finally worked up some absolutely horrible practical joke uh -huh. involving his false teeth, I think, uh -huh. to drive him away. Gurdjieff immediately drove to Paris and offered to pay him to come back. <laughs> because the way he annoyed people mm -hmm. gave them incredible opportunities to observe their machinery in mm -hmm. action. So, you know, I'm, I might think I'm a calm, easygoing kind of person. 
But certain situations, oh. Push your buttons. I need the button pushed. And if I'm already committed to really closely observing myself, mm -hmm. then what would be just an annoyance becomes a great opportunity to learn something about my conditioning, uh -huh. my defense mechanisms, etc. Now, you uh, led groups th that did this type of work. Yes, eventually I led just one group, not many of them, and mm -hmm. so forth. And you attended others. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I was involved in several Gurdjieff groups. There, there, like happens with many spiritual movements, when the leader dies, different disciples break off and say, I'm the real successor, and those other people don't really understand what's going on. Yeah. So, you know, you have to take your choice on which one is the real one. Um, his stuff lends itself to abuse, so there have been very abusive people who have claimed that they're teaching people to be awake. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it sounds like one might argue Gurdjieff himself abused people. Yeah. Well, it's like this way. If, if you're dying because your liver is going to explode pretty soon and you won't allow me to cut you open to operate, you're going to die. Yeah. Um, I may have to remind you that you're going to die if you don't do something about this. Mm -hmm. That was his attitude. I, I don't like that kind of attitude. I'm not that kind of person. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't be mean to people unless I'm in a very bad state myself. and uh -huh. I don't like the way I am when I'm that way. So, you know, I, the way I present Gurdjieff is a much gentler mm -hmm. way of inviting people to become more aware of the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's really the essence of the work in a way, to begin to bring your consciousness into a preciser awareness of what's happening at this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I'm talking to you, what am I doing with my hands? What's the position I'm sitting in? What's that noise in the background? Not so much that I lose track of what you're saying, but all of these things are happening now, and some of them may be relevant. Yeah. Whereas ordinarily, I'll have my idea of who you are and what you're going to say, and I'm going to be living in a semi-dream state with my ideas of what you're like, mm -hmm. modulating my actual perception view, and I may miss important cues about what's really on your mind that way. Mm. Well, it seems almost inevitable. You, you can't pick up everything. No, you can't pick up everything. But if you know you can't pick up everything, you've got a big jump ahead. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just assume you've got it all taken care of and it's really your automatic mechanisms mm -hmm. working, you know, that's how he, ins one of the primary ways Gurdjieff insulted people, man is a machine. Mm -hmm. You don't need to study any psychology, you study machines. Push button A, machine B moves in a certain way. That's that's our conditioning. Yeah, yeah. The machine's and more complicated than that, but we really are automatic. But in my, many yes, ways. much of Western behavioral psychology, the whole stimulus response arc, is about exactly that. Right. Except the behaviorists were stuck in a sterile view of the universe, where there's no spiritual possibility mm -hmm. behind beginning to understand what the behavior is. I. Let, let me make this more personal. I'm, I'm not some kind of Gurdjieff teacher, you know. There's mm -hmm. no branch of the Gurdjieff work that's ever authorized me to teach. I've even been thrown out of one or two branches of the Gurdjieff work for, for questioning some of the things in there. Mm -hmm. But my questioning is usually, I hope, a genuine desire to understand things better. I'm not a very good follower that mm -hmm. way. So, and I'm also very interested in Buddhism for the meditative aspects of it. So I go on Buddhist-oriented retreats because yeah. the meditation is a way of seeing my own internal processes more clearly in a way. Mm -hmm. But Buddhism is too isolated. It's like you spend a million hours sitting on a little cushion surrounded by other people sitting on cushions, and you may get more mindful of your mental processes in that condition, but then you go out into the world where it's all very different and you forget mm -hmm. about it. Whereas the emphasis in Gurdjieff is on developing this quicker, deeper awareness in actual life situations. Mm. Um, and I, I presume no, meditation ever, is not particularly part of the Gurdjieff work. There's uh, Some of the Gurdjieff work involves some meditation, but the emphasis is on practicing mindfulness in every life. Mm -hmm. 
Very few people have ever gotten in trouble while they're sitting on a little black cushion. In, in fact, the very term Gurdjieff work, you know, yeah, it, work, it does imply, and I think Gurdjieff writes about this, the importance of, of work, of doing, accomplishing things. Right. And of bringing your mindfulness to life, mm -hmm. because in your, I mean, how many mistakes have we all made while we were supposedly sane and conscious? But actually, mm -hmm. you know, how many times have we looked back and said, how could I have done that thing? It makes no sense at all, but I did it gustily. Yeah. And learning to observe yourself, to understand the mechanism, to be more aware makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I gave a sort of idealistic split between intellect, emotion, body instinctual and all that. They actually interact in some ways. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the primary way of splitting your attention so you're taking and seeing and hearing and some body sensation logically you would think that makes you more aware of seeing and hearing but actually it also makes you more aware of your emotions because uh -huh. emotions have bodily components they're all connected yeah so you pick up aspects of emotions that mm -hmm. might you might not normally consciously be aware of but are beginning to start to control you mm -hmm. and by picking them up earlier you mm -hmm. have more choice as to whether mm -hmm. you want to go with that or supersede it mm -hmm. well charlie tart thank you so much for sharing these reflections uh, i think as we look at the gurdjieff work we see it had a, a real influence in its own day and mm -hmm. uh now through uh, people such as yourself that influence continues to grow i hope so there's mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff in it yeah Thank you for being with me, Charlie. Thank you for a chance to talk about it, Jeff. And thank you for being with us.